All right, folks, uh, we're going to get started. Uh, so there is no, um, the mic is not working today. Uh, you, if, if you're having trouble hearing me right now or the speaker. Or just raise your hand yeah. and I'll speak up. Well. Just, oh, I think just move, move up. Like there's, there's a lot of empty seats um, up here. Um, so um, it's my pleasure to introduce the ISR and CS distinguished speaker. Um, his name is uh, Nasko Runtaf, uh, Professor of Computer Science and Engineering at the Ohio State University. Um, so Nasco's uh, area of research is program analysis and you know software analysis and testing, and he's done some foundational work in that area. Uh, he's especially done a lot of work in Android um, program analysis, which he's going to talk about today. Which you know in my group we've used um, a lot of his techniques um, in the past. Uh, he's on the editorial board of ACM TOSUM. He's received numerous research awards: um, NSF Career Award, uh, ACM Distinguished Paper Award, and his uh, best. Um, Creation best contribution has been Professor Harry Shu in the CS department. <laughs> <laughs> so with that, Absolutely. Nasko, you have the floor. <laughs> Thank you, Sam. I appreciate it. It is indeed my <laughs> proudest achievement right now. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, as Sam said, I am uh, Nasko Runtef. I'm a professor at Ohio State. I've been there since 2002, and uh, today I'll talk about work on static analysis for Android. This is joint work with. Uh, a lot of students from my group, and I do want to acknowledge their contributions. Without them, this work would not have been possible. And of course, I want to acknowledge all of the funding that we have received for this work. So before getting into the technical details, um, I wanted to summarize sort of the high-level messages you can take from, from this talk. The first one that, the first thing I will claim is that if you consider static control flow and data flow analysis for Android, um, in particular for Android graphical user interfaces, uh, we do not yet have a very strong foundation for knowing how to do these types of analysis. Uh, despite the fact that a lot of people have done work on static analysis for Android in the last you know, five, six, seven years, uh, I, will, I will still claim that we are far away from having you know, a solid foundation there. What I will describe are some steps that we have taken to you know, kind of make, make progress in that direction in my group. And also, I will talk about some of the open problems that I consider to be really critical in this space. The second thing, the second message is that even though we really have not gone as far as I personally would like to see, um, there is already enough, enough knowledge at this point so that we can create fairly useful models for Android GUI structure and behavior. And we can use them for a number of different things. One particular example I will give is this idea of static analysis for resource leaks. Um, this is one application of this, and there are a number of others, including automated test generation and various types of profiling and so on. And the final message, which maybe is even more important, is that I think we as a community should start thinking a little bit beyond your regular Android devices and applications and start looking at sort of the broader picture one example I will give very briefly is analysis for Android Wear applications. So these are applications, for example, for your smartwatch. Um, and there's a number of other interesting uh, questions in that space that I'll, I'll mention briefly. So very briefly, why do we care about Android? You know, I'm sure a lot of people in this room will agree with this very quickly. There are a lot of devices. There are a lot of uh, applications. One interesting thing that seems to be happening is that there are a lot more app markets that are developing. For example, in China now, there's a very rich ecosystem of app markets for Android that are separate from Google Play. Uh, and of course, there's a widespread use in daily life. How many of you can live without your phone for more than a day? Um, <laughs> at the same time, it's not just phones, it's not just tablets. We have these, you know, the smart TVs, the smart appliances, the wearable devices. There's Android for automobiles and so on. Uh, and this trend is inevitably going to continue. We will continue seeing more and more of these types of non-traditional computing devices being used more widely in daily life. For software engineering programming languages researchers, we're basically facing the same types of problems we've faced before. How do we improve the software quality? How do we improve the, the programmer productivity? With the help of various techniques such as program analysis, static checking, dynamic checking, profiling, program optimizations, and so on. Security analysis, of course. And hopefully some of you at least will agree that in a lot of these techniques that I'm talking about here, static analysis machinery is a critical building block. If you know how to do static analysis, it enables you to build a lot of useful, interesting techniques uh, in that space. 
So speaking of static analysis, let me draw a quick analogy um, between traditional static analysis, particular control flow and data flow analysis, and what happens in Android. How many people in this room have taken a compiler class where they have seen this notion of a control flow graph? Most of you, I would say. So control flow graph is a very simple example of a static representation of possible runtime behaviors. It's a traditional example of a model that can be used to, to identify, let's say, nodes representing statements, edges representing sequencing of statements, and then based on that you can talk about paths and loops and all kinds of interesting properties of the runtime control flow. Now, we know how to do control flow analysis very well, even for more complicated things such as, let's say, polymorphic calls in object-oriented programming, such as exceptions, for example, which are a little trickier, but overall we know how to do that. Uh, Android control flow is, is a different beast. It's all event driven. Now I'm going to focus specifically on the control flow in the graphical user interface part of the app. This is the main thread of execution and this is where a lot of the logic of the application happens. All the control flow is event driven. There are events trigger, triggered by the interaction of that user with the interface, you know, clicking on a button, opening a new window, pressing various menu and back buttons, and so on. Every single one of those is essentially an event that gets processed by the Android framework and results in some kind of callback into the application code. So you have this very callback driven structure of the control flow, which is not like a regular program. We just have a main, and main calls A, and A calls B, and so on. So doing control flow analysis in this context is much more complicated. Another example that is naturally derived from here is data flow analysis. So if you've taken a compiler class, you've probably heard of reaching definitions analysis, which is sort of your prototypical data flow analysis. The idea there is that in the control flow graph, you have some notion of a solution at a particular node of your control flow model, and you have some algorithms that propagate this information across the edges and so on. Well, it's similar in Android except for there are a lot of complications. One of the biggest complications is that there's silent propagation of data across the framework code. So as I'll see, as we'll see in an example a little bit later, you can have two variables that actually have the same value. The value of one of them goes to the other one, but there is no explicit relationship between them in the code of the app. There's no assignments or anything like that. They just, they look unrelated, but in reality they are related because of the Android semantic. So uh, there are other categories of, of issues, you know, the, if you consider the semantics of, let's say, individual graph nodes in your control flow graph, you know, in a regular language, it's simple stuff. You know, you have an assignment, A is assigned B. We know how to model this statically, it's sort of fairly straightforward. But if you start considering some of the more complicated operations that appear in Android applications, the semantics is actually very rich. One single statement can have very complicated effects. So my claim, which I'm, I'm willing to stick to, is that at this point of time, the community in general does not have well-defined general, fully general techniques to defining static, and, uh, static analysis of control flow and data flow for Android. I will talk about two specific aspects of this problem and some progress that my group has made. Um, the, first, the first problem is statically identifying some model of the structure of the graphical user interface of, of the application. Um, this boils down to really three different things. It's about widgets, you know, things like buttons. It's about windows that contains this, contain these widgets, and it's about event handlers that get triggered when such, you know, when let's say a click event on a button happens. Being able to statically model these relationships, these objects and their relationships, is kind of the first step of, being, of doing control flow analysis. The next step after that is to figure out, given the structure, what are the possible behaviors? For example, what are the possible sequences of events? What are the possible sequences of windows? And what are the possible sequences of callbacks that occur as a result of that? Can I ask a question? Absolutely. I think most of the stuff you talk about here targets Java, right? high level kind of Java programs. Absolutely. But there's a big kind of ocean of code underneath Java, which is this operating systems. Like Android OS or Android VM, whatever you want to call it, right? Mm -hmm. So then, is, are you aware of any analysis that can handle both systems code and Java code together? So, or this is, that, is that important? First of all, you have two choices in how to go, how to go and start analyzing Android applications. And right. this, this sort of goes to your question. Right. 
One of the choices is to stop your analysis at the level of calls that go into the API framework, uh, in, into the API methods. Uh, sorry, into the framework methods. Um, and then, whenever you see one of these calls in your static analysis, you actually try to model its semantics right. without worrying what is the code of that particular, uh, oh. of that particular uh, method. Mm -hmm. This is the approach we take. And the right. reason I feel this is the right approach, and some people have taken different approaches, is that it's very hard to model the high-level semantics of the framework code if you just analyze the framework code itself. For example, there's an event loop somewhere in there. Right. There's an event queue. Right. If you try to analyze this in any sort of existing type of analysis technique, you will not be able to get anything. Now, the question of what happens underneath, right. <clears throat> typically the semantics of these API calls to framework methods would involve any effects that also come from the underlying, let's say, C code and so on. Um, I will get back to this question of <laughs> semantics because that's one of the trickiest, this is sort of what the, one of the root problems in a lot of these sort of weak foundations that I mentioned earlier. Um, but let me get to that a little okay. bit later. Yeah. So I will first talk about this, the problem of how to identify the, the structure of the GUI statically. Um, it's really, in some sense, a fairly natural manifestation of what are the interesting runtime entities that exist as you're working with your Android application. The graphical user interface is what the users interact with. The events in that interface drive the entire behavior of your application. And as I said earlier, the, there's a main thread of the application that is the event handling thread that is about handling you know, whatever you do as a user on the widgets and reacting to that. Specifically, in this talk, I'll talk about activities, widgets, which in Android are called views, and event handlers, which in Android are defined inside listener objects. And we'll see examples, concrete examples of this. And the goal here is to model statically the relationships between different, these different entities. And those of you that have studied any sort of static analysis, if you've seen points to analysis, for example, this has a similar flavor, but it's a little bit more complicated. It's in fact, a lot more complicated. So let me go straight to an example. If you've never seen Android, this may come as a, as a you know, sort of a, a bit of a rude awakening, but it's in the afternoon, so I'm hoping to wake up. <laughs> um, this is an example of something called an activity. And again, you can roughly speaking think of this as the equivalent of a window. It's not quite the same, but close enough. Um, the blue method here on create is an example of a callback that gets invoked by the Android framework. In this particular uh, case, the on create is part of the initialization. Basically, when you open the window, the callback happens, gets executed, completes execution, controls go, control goes back to the framework, and then sort of the next step depends on what you do. For example, you may click some widget on that window to trigger the next callback. In this particular example, this on click here is actually a callback that will be triggered when a button displayed in this window is actually clicked <coughs> by the user. And again, in this case, this on click will happen. It will execute something, and then control returns back to the framework code. So the sequence of these callbacks fundamentally defines the behavior of your, of, of your GUI. There are a couple other things going on here. For example, here we have on the bottom this XML file, which describes the structure of the GUI in terms of the different widgets that exist in it. Um, roughly speaking, this is a tree. In this simple case, it just has two nodes. Uh, the relative layout is a particular type of widget, which you can think of this as a essentially invisible container. And then the button on the bottom has actual visible manifestation, and this is something that the user will interact with. On top of that, this button has some particular ID, which is defined inside the file, the XML file. Unlike your typical, you know, Static analysis. Here we actually have to account for this external information because what happens as you start executing this on create method, there is a call in here. The details are not important, but essentially what happens is that this XML file is being used as a template to instantiate a bunch of objects on the heap to represent this, these two different widgets. And that gets attached to the window, to this my activity. So this is how you actually create this, the manifestation of the widgets in memory. So if you do static analysis, you actually have to look at this and model it statically. On top of that, there's a, a wide variety of other interesting operations. Here's one, this find view by ID, 
It takes as a parameter this r.id.my button, which is just a funny name for a constant, for an integer constant. And this constant is the equivalent of this ID that is declared in the XML file. And what this operation does, it, it actually starts from the activity, goes to this entire tree, starts looking from the root of that tree, goes down and keeps looking until it finds a widget that happens to have that same ID. So it's a fairly complicated semantics. It's not as simple as you know, x is assigned y plus z, something like that. If you want to do static analysis, you have to model that as well. Uh, and furthermore, once you get to that, then that button object gets returned back here and A, variable A starts pointing to it. In this particular example, A is assigned to B, so now B starts pointing to it. And then that B is used in something called set on click listeners, which is a way to, to associate to that button object a listener, which would be the event handler. Uh, in this case, <coughs> that listener is created here, variable C points to it, and this call uses the C as a parameter. So now you have a listener object, you have a button object, and you have a relationship between the two. If you click on that button, that event listener, uh, event handler will be invoked on the button listener object. And the actual event handler is this on click that I mentioned earlier. And the parameters of this event handler really are the same as the ones that appear here. For example, the B, which points to the button, has the same value as the D, which points to the button. So this is one example of that implicit flow that I was describing earlier. There is a relationship between B and D. They actually have the same value. But there is no assignment anywhere in the code that says, yes, the value of D really came from B. So if you are planning to, you know, sketch, to, to model this uh, statically, you have to account for that relationship. And furthermore, if you consider the C here, which is pointing to this button listener object, this on click has an implicit parameter THIS, this, which points to that same listener object. So you have to account for that relationship as well. So this is all great. This is a simple example. If you haven't gotten every single detail, that's OK. You know, if you don't know Android, that's OK as well. The important point is that there are some fairly non-trivial things that happen that go beyond the traditional semantics of, let's say, you're playing Java code. And statically, if you wanted to create a static analysis for that, you have to model these very carefully. What you do need to model, and this is described in the paper, is various categories of operations. For example, this, this idea of taking this XML file, which describes a bunch of widgets, and inflating it in memory to create heap objects to represent that structure. The idea of sometimes creating these widgets programmatically, instead of reading it from the XML file, is a new button in the code. You have to handle that as well. This find view that I mentioned earlier, you can think of this as sort of an abstraction of this find view by ID operations, where you provide an ID and you look up a widget in a whole tree of widgets. That is also necessary to, to, to model the set listener we saw a little earlier, where you have a listener object and a widget, and that listener becomes you know, aware of this widget and listens to events to it. And also, you can programmatically create hierarchies by adding parents and children. You can programmatically change the IDs of these widgets. Mm -hmm. So it is rather complicated, and we have developed a static analysis to model all of these aspects of the semantics. Now, how this analysis works is not horribly important. Uh, the details, obviously, are described in various documents. But the basic idea is not very surprising. You start by modeling somehow the structure of the program by introducing various entities. For example, this My Activity box corresponds to an instance of this class, which, by the way, is created by the framework. There's no new My Activity in the app code. It just happens behind the scenes. There are various variables, the THIS, the B, the, the A, the B, the C, and so on. There are also nodes that represent these operations, inflate and find V, for example, that correspond to these API calls. And this can be constructed roughly speaking, through a linear scan through the, the app code. Um, those of you that have done points to analysis will see some resemblance to, to similar types of structures in points to analysis. Can, can one think of this as artificially created flow graph? Perhaps yes, it is essentially graph. a flow graph, yeah. except for typically in your flow graphs that you consider for Java, let's say, the nodes represent very simple things. Mm -hmm. uh, they typically don't re represent operations. They simply represent this value gets copied here. Yeah. That's essentially what happens. Here, the, the semantics of find view 
is fairly complicated. And while we can create this, we still have to analyze the structure of this code and start propagating information through it. And during that propagation, actually model that semantics. So without getting into every single detail, the static analysis will look at the XML file, will look at the structure described there, will create some internal representation of that structure, and at this point of at this particular API call, it will essentially create this internal representation within the analysis data structures. It simply says this particular set of widgets is associated with that inflate operation. And from the graph on the previous slide, a few extra edges actually tell us that the activity that flows to this inflate operation is this one. Given this knowledge, we can determine that the entire hierarchy of widgets gets associated with my activity, and the root of that hierarchy is this relative layout. And furthermore, now that we have this information in the static analysis, we can sort of look at this code that used to be here. For example, all of this stuff that I showed you earlier, we can propagate data along these different assignments and so on, and we can figure out at the end that this button actually has a button listener, which is the object created right here, as a result of the set listener operation. And all of that is done in sort of in the traditional propagation. You compute a fixed point and so on. If you don't know what a fixed point is, consider <coughs> yourself lucky. <laughs> so how does that, so the details again are not very important, but what happens is, we, what happened is that we did implement this and we went through several iterations. It's publicly available. Uh, the actual analysis implementation starts from Dalvik bytecode. That gets translated into the intermediate representation of something called SUT, which is a popular framework for static analysis for Java. Some, some people in this room have used SUT. Actually, several people have used SUT. Uh, and then there's a propagation algorithm, and the result of that is an output that gives you static abstractions of the building blocks, the activities, and also other windows I haven't talked about yet, uh, called menus and dialogues, and the hierarchies, and so on. What happens is that if you study uh, you know, the implementation of this approach, in general has a good precision and good running time. Uh, at the same time, it has room for improvement. For example, the precision could be improved by dealing with um, calls, polymorphic calls, a little bit more precisely. That's one known source of imprecision. It's not a big deal. We just haven't done it. Uh, the cost, initially when we started doing this work, the cost was never an issue. This was a very fast analysis. And with time, we have seen apps that are larger and larger, sort of more and more complicated. And cost has started becoming a bit of an issue. So there's some, some algorithm, simple algorithmic uh, improvements that could be done to improve the, the, the running time and scalability. And a usual problem in this space is that the set of Android features you model, sort of it's a moving target. For example, uh, we still haven't gotten to the, uh, the fragments, even though we've been planning to do this for a while. Um, those of you that know Android will know what I'm talking about, and if you don't, that's perfectly fine. But the point is that the set of features you need to deal with becomes larger and larger with every sort of evolution of Android. Despite all of that, this is a good starting point to consider the next problem, which is now that I have the structure, how does it behave? What are the sequences of things that could happen in the execution of the GUI? Um, and we've talked about this already. It's an event-driven type of control flow. You have a callback, for example, this on click that gets executed as a result of some user event. Inside the body of that callback method, there's some code whose execution may trigger various things, including it could open new windows or it could close existing windows. Now, whenever you open a window or close a window, there are additional callbacks mm -hmm. that happen as, sort of, as a side effect of that. For example, this on create that I showed you earlier is used as part of that initialization of a new window. There's a whole bunch of them, and I'll see, we'll see some examples of those. So the effects of these callbacks are surprisingly complicated and really took me and you know, uh, one student quite a you know, significant amount of time to have some reasonable static representation of this rather, rather complicated control flow. And one thing that came out of that was that somewhat surprisingly, if you consider the sequence of events that could happen, the effects of the callbacks and so on, you actually have to keep track of the history of how you got to that event through prior events to be able to precisely model what exactly happens, uh, which was initially something that we, we, you know, we were not really 
you know, aware of, but, but really became clear at some point we had to do it. So the product of that work was a static model that we call the window transition graph. It's a very simple graph which just has a bunch of nodes representing windows and then edges representing transitions from one window to the next one. And in the static analysis to build this graph, that the sort of the key technical advance was this idea of a window stack where we maintain internally some approximation of the set of currently open windows where the top of the stack is the window that is currently displayed to the user. Um, if you have heard of the activity stack in Android, some of you may have, this is sort of a generalization of that idea. So here's another example. Again, there's a lot of detail here and you don't have to parse everything right away. Um, there are four activities. This is from a particular app uh, that we analyzed. It's simplified from a particular app. And each one of those four activity, choose file activity, open file activity, options, and about, is represented by a node in this window transition graph. So A1, A2, A3, and A4 directly correspond to those activities. And then on top of that, there's this funny options menu window, which corresponds to a menu associated with open file activity. This happens, for example, when you press the menu button. A menu pops up, there are a bunch of items on it, for example, in this particular example, there's a menu item that says, oh, open a new window that tells me about the application, or open a new window that tells me about the options of this application. So given this, the blue items represent the event handler callbacks. For example, this first one corresponds to clicking on an item of a list, and the list itself is displayed as part of the choose file activity window. So you have an item, list item, you click on it, and two things could happen. One of them is that under some condition, you know, you don't open any new windows, you don't close any windows, you essentially remain static with respect to the state. I mean, something could change on the current window, but you don't change the set of windows. And the second possibility is that you have this call to start activity. If this if becomes uh, false, this will open a new window. And we can represent this in a fairly straightforward way using you know, two edges, one of them corresponding to one outcome of executing this event handler callback, the second one corresponding to this outcome where we actually call star activity. You can ignore the intent object, it's just one particular mechanism in Android, it's not very important. It is just a way of opening this open file activity. Now, in our window transition graph, we have the ability to identify the specific widgets, the specific events, and the specific callbacks that happen as part of a particular transition. In this case, if you go in A1, you press this menu, uh, this, uh, you, you press this list item, and you get to A2, there's a fairly complicated sequence of callbacks that happens. First, the first one is on item click, that executes and completes. Control goes back to the framework. Then there's an on pause of A1 that executes and completes. Then there's an on create of A2 that executes and completes. And then there's an on start of A2. And then there's an on resume of A2. And then there's an on stop of A1. If you wanted to analyze what happens with your app as you transition from basically from this window, you open this one, you have to account for that particular sequence because that's what the control flow is. And the edge here is actually annotated with that sequence. Inside each one of these, there is a standard traditional control flow graph with the nodes and the edges representing what they normally represent. But if you really want to do control flow analysis, you have to use this high level, top level structure first as a sort of the, the, guiding, you know, the, the, the guiding framework. Um, another thing I did want to mention, this is the entire graph, has a lot of edges in it. But one thing I did want to mention that when you start analyzing these event handler callbacks, you often see a pattern of this nature. This is another event handler callback. When you open that menu that I mentioned earlier, it says, which particular item in that menu am I touching? Am I touching the item that says, open the about window? Or am I touching the item that says, open the options window? And you very often see this type of structure where you have some conditionals that say, if it's this particular item, do one thing, and if it's this other item, do, do this other thing. Now, those of you that are static analysis people will realize that if you simply analyze this thing just as one single monolithic entity, this will be very imprecise because you will say, oh, if I call this callback, 
you know, one of two things could happen. So that actually turns out to uh, result in very imprecise uh, static models. What you really have to do is you have to treat this input as a context and actually analyze that callback under this context, in some sense, two different times. In one time, you will say this if is true and therefore this thing will happen. In the second time, you'll have this if is true and then this sequence of operations will happen. So you need a context sensitive analysis of the callbacks. Um, Does this actually pass on statement? It's not really well, pass. it turns out that all you need to do is, yes, you do need to do something that resembles path sensitivity, mm -hmm. but what you really typically can get away with is you use this information that this particular parameter has that particular right. value. The calling context for that. You, pro you propagate this to as many simple things as you can, and this is typically enough to resolve many ifs and say this if can go only to the true part, or this if can go only to the false part. And of course, similar things with switch statements and so on. Um, and that, that really helps with the precision. One last thing I want to point out is that as you start opening these windows, you have to account, for example, here in one of these ifs, we open the about window. And you have to account for the fact that this has some effects on the window stack that I mentioned earlier. Really what happens here is if you select that menu button, and then you select that menu item, the menu automatically gets closed, and then you open A3. So if you go along this path, you have this sequence of events that happens on this conceptual window stack. And it gets even more complicated because if you consider the other option here, which is you know, the other item in this menu, there's this funny call to finish, which closes the current window. So now what you have is close M, close A2, and open 8.4 in one single action, essentially, one single transition. So that is attached, this label is actually attached to that particular edge, which in this case is this E8 edge. So getting this right is tricky, but I think we did it correctly. This is the final graph. Obviously, you don't have to read all these details. The one thing I will mention is that in this graph, not every single path is actually a feasible path that represents a real runtime behavior. Even though we've paid you know, great care to make sure that the edges are right, that doesn't mean that the paths are right. Um, and just to give an example, consider the red path. Start from A1, A2, M, A3, A1. This red path and the edges are highlighted here. If you consider the sequence of push and pop operations on that, this is actually a bad sequence in the, in the following sense. If you consider that sequence here, you know, this push and this pop you know, cancel each other out. This push and this pop cancel each other out. A2 is not canceled, which means that A2 is on the top of the stack. This is actually the window that is visible to the user at the moment when the entire path completes. But unfortunately, the last edge, the last node of this edge here is not A2, it's A1, which means that this is really a bad path. There's no way to trigger this path at runtime. So by using this sequence of push and pop effects, you can actually filter out some of the paths. And the next example is for a good path, which basically matches appropriately. I'm not going to talk about that. But I will mention that the choice of, of this path validity uh, check actually is important because if you don't do it, you, you see a lot of imprecision at it. So but still, it's still sound. Right. Yes, it is still sound, but it's imprecise. Exactly. So one of the problems, if it's imprecise, is that any subsequent static analysis may have more false positives. Yeah. And the other one is that, for example, if you're doing test generation, you can have a lot of completely garbage test cases that actually cannot be triggered at runtime. If you consider this sort of very simple uh, kind of description of that, on the x-axis, we have various apps. On the y-axis, we have the percentage reduction in the number of paths <coughs> that you get if you apply the validity check. So the higher the bar, the more impact you have by doing this path validity check. Uh, the blue represents path of length two and the, the red represents path of length three. Bottom line is that there are a decent number of pretty high bars here. This is a percentage reduction and essentially says that if, you don't, if you're not careful with your path validity, you will actually get a lot of garbage paths. That's really the, the, the message. To so I will stop here with that particular aspect of my talk. Of course, I will run a little bit out of time, but that's okay.
Um, one thing that I do want to mention, very substantial, uh, substantial problem here, is that you know this has advanced, I believe, the state of the art uh, in a number of ways, but it's still far away from where I personally, as a static analysis person, would like to see things up. Uh, there are a lot of problems. Uh, one of these problems is concurrency. So, so far, everything I have described happens in one thread, which is the main thread of the application, which is the GUI thread. This is the one that processes events. Typically, you can't do that. If you have something that is expensive, you don't want to do it in the GUI thread. You know, sort of want to move it out. Now, the way you would normally do this would create a new Java thread or something, but in Android, typically, there are Android-specific mechanisms for doing that. There's these things called handlers and a couple other similar techniques. And the, the static modeling of that is highly underdeveloped at this point of time. The state of the art is very unsatisfactory. Mm -hmm. We have done a little bit of work on that. You know, one of my students in his PhD dissertation did some modeling of that. It's a good first step, but there's a lot more to be done. Mm -hmm. The second important problem is completeness. So as you have seen, there are a lot of Android-specific details here. And the key question is, well, how do you know you've captured all of them? And the answer is, no, you haven't. If anyone comes to you, any static analysis person comes to you and says, I have a sound analysis for Android, uh, you just, they'll lie to you. Okay? There's, uh, there's simply not enough good understanding of the low level details of the Android semantics to make a claim that you have covered all possible cases. That's the reality of it. Um, and you can actually very easily demonstrate this. We did a very sort of fun little workshop paper where one of the students did some experimentation with running dynamic traces. So you get dynamic traces and then you compare them against the static solution. If you know anything about static analysis, you know of course that the static analysis should explain all the dynamic traces. Like anything you see dynamically should be derivable also from the static solution. But no, that's not the case. So we did this comparison with our stuff. We did this comparison with FlowDroid, which some of you have probably heard of. It's a fairly popular static analysis for information flow for, for Android. There are many, many different reasons why these, these analyses do not capture all possible runtime behaviors, but they don't. Uh, some of them are more fundamental than others. Um, and that's, I would claim, it's sort of the state of the art, which is kind of sad to say the state of the art. Um, another thing that I do want to mention, and I'll probably say it again, give me a second, is that as Android evolves, it becomes harder and harder to make arguments that you have covered all possible execution scenarios. So it, again, it's a moving target. You know, the, there's a new version of Android comes up, and all of a sudden, you, you're not quite sure if your static analysis is really working right on that version. Go ahead, Josh. Sure. So um, thank you. Uh, so since you mentioned FlowDroid, uh, I'm curious to what extent you've applied the analysis. That's something that like Gator can do mm -hmm. to see what uh, other kinds of client analysis may improve, uh, particularly in terms of precision. Um, have you done anything like that? So actually, results? yeah, I was, I was, thank you for, this is a very nice lead into my next, you know, <laughs> my, my next topic, which is how do you use these admittedly <coughs> imperfect <coughs> models and analyses to actually do something interesting? Um, the, this particular topic, I think, is, is worth discussing a little bit more detail because it just highlights how this very naturally matches with a particular type of client. But the other ones are also interesting, and you know, I would obviously encourage you to have a look at them. So <coughs> the, the question is, can you actually get something good out of these models? Um, and the, the particular context of this client is static analysis to identify potential energy inefficiencies. So the idea is actually quite simple. You have certain energy uh, draining, if you want to think of it that way, resources, such as the GPS or hardware sensors. And if you acquire them, and typically you acquire them by registering a listener. So a listener says, oh, I need to get the updates from the GPS. Keep it alive. Keep giving me data about it. If you register it, but then you don't unregister it or on time, you actually keep the GPS going and you start draining the battery. So the idea is to define both patterns of runtime inefficiencies as well as static analysis to ident identify these patterns. I'm actually going to skip the definition of the patterns, which comes up later, but I will just illustrate it with a very simple example. This has a single activity in it, this demo activity. It has on create and on resume, which are callbacks that happen as essentially the window gets initialized. You have an on destroy, which is a callback that happens when the window is destroyed, not surprisingly. And then you have some button here, which has an on click listener, 
And then when you click on that button, the onclick listener invokes this register listeners method in a helper class, in this manager class. And this manager class calls this API, which says the request location updates. The parameter here is really appointed to the manager object. This green call basically says, I'm registering a listener to the GPS. Just simplify this a little bit. Give me GPS coordinates at a sort of regular rate. So at this point of time, it's all great. Maybe the app wants to know what the GPS coordinates are. Except for if you now look at the, the window transition graph and this particular path through it, this corresponds to the on create, on resume. This corresponds to the on click. This corresponds to the on destroy. So suppose you open the app, you press the button, and you basically exit the app. If you do that, you have registered the listener, but you've never unregistered it, which means that now the app is gone, but the, is, the, the, the listener is still listening, and the GPS sort of has to stay active. So this type of leak pattern can be defined precisely in terms of properties of these uh, paths in the window transition graph, and I am going to skip this part because I'm running out of time. It requires various static analysis of callbacks, other context, you know, this context sensitivity business, some constant propagation, all kinds of details that are not important right now. And one interesting question is, you know, static detection is all great in theory, but is it actually doing well in practice? Because often this type of detection is done dynamically. You, know, you would run some test cases, you would try to figure out what happens at runtime, or oh, is this listener still alive after I exit and so on. And we did some comparison with the dynamic analysis that did this type of work. Um, and for the GUI based, basically the places where the defect was in the GUI logic, we found that the static analysis does as well as the dynamic one, and even find some new problems that dynamic analysis was, did, was not reporting. Uh, as far as precision, you know, there were 17 defects reported, of which 16 we validated on the device. We actually looked at what's happening on the device. And there was one that was sort of like a false positive, but in reality, there was a proper problem in the app. So you could very much argue that the, the app should be fixed, even though it's not technically instance of this pattern. Mm -hmm. So the main point I want to make here is that with the help of these GUI models, because we have a good model of the control flow, you can now start analyzing different paths to that model, the effects of individual mm -hmm. callbacks along these paths. And you can, for example, talk about leak types of properties. And it's certainly not the only, the only type of problem. So the other part, the test generation, I'll mention in one sentence. One of these paths is a very natural test case. Basically, every edge is an event. You can use something like UI Automator, which is you know, one of poss several possible you know, testing frameworks for Android, and you can map this directly to a test case. Now, it's not as, you know, as simple as that. Obviously, if you have to enter a password somewhere along the test case, you know, the static analysis can't do anything about that. But as far as the control flow and the sequence of events, different paths very naturally correspond to test cases, and you can, you can get them essentially for free. Uh, the profiling is also interesting. You can also do interesting profiling to make sure that these event handlers are not too expensive, because if they're too expensive, your GUI freezes and people get very upset. Uh, I will not talk about that, but it, you know, it's, it's just another application of the same way. So let me move on in the, the, the few remaining minutes into kind of a relatively new topic that we started looking at more recently, which is going beyond this idea of, you know, here's a phone or a tablet, here you have some Android apps on it and so on, and looking at uh, specifically about uh, the applications that run on wearable devices. Some people in this room, I saw you have smartwatches. I saw you, some of you. <laughs> I don't have one because I don't have anything. But um, it's an interesting area in which more and more action is happening. You have to separate a little bit kind of the, the hype that comes from places like Google or Apple or whatever from the long-term prospects. The hype of selling a particular product or a particular generation of this technology, you, maybe you buy it, maybe you don't. That's one aspect. But the long-term the long-term prospects are inevitably that we will have wearable devices embedded in our daily lives in a variety of ways we cannot even imagine yet. It's probably not going to be Google Glass, but it will be something that you'll see in many scenarios, including field work, healthcare, you know, industrial applications, um, fitness, obviously, already. Um, things that 
will be very interesting to look at over the next 10, 20 years. Now, what we have looked at specifically here is an extremely narrow slice of that space, <coughs> which is the analysis and testing of GUI elements for Android Wear applications. Android Wear is just Google's proposal for that. It has evolved in a number of different ways. I think the new generation, which came out last year, is really much more substantial and, and really ready for more interesting applications. There are two different categories. One of them is you can have an application that runs on the smartwatch completely independently of anyone, anything else. In fact, they have access to GPS, they, they have access to Wi-Fi. They're very, you know, very full-fledged in some sense applications. You also have a different model where you have a companion handheld device, which would typically be a smartphone. And that sort of works in conjunction with, let's say, the smartwatch. The case we did consider is the idea of running a piece of code on the smartphone, but actually having notifications that show up on your smartwatch. And we have started looking beyond that. We started actually looking at standalone applications that are just running without any phones, just running on the, on the, on, uh, the smartwatch. But I will not talk about that. So with a little picture, hopefully I can illustrate what's going on. Imagine this is a phone. There's an app running on it, and this phone is actually coupled with a smartwatch. And at some point, the app running on the phone issues a notification that displays on the watch. For example, this is a, a real example from a messaging application that says, oh, you just received a message, a locker from this particular user. And then by swiping on the phone, you can actually go through the sequence of screens and say, oh, what is my history of messages from this particular user? And if you swipe one more time, you get a screen that says, oh yeah, press this button, you can reply to that message. If you swipe one more time on the watch, you can say, you know, mark this as red. If you do it one more time, you get to this screen. And if you press this button, you actually open a new activity on the phone. Mm -hmm. So now you have this two these two devices that kind of communicate in certain ways. A piece of code is running on the phone. Something that it does triggers GUI effects on the watch, and something you do on the watch then triggers effects back on the phone. It's a non-trivial set of interactions that, of course, we became interested in modeling this statically, because that's, we're in the business of static analysis. Uh, without you having to worry at all about the details here, just a little sample of the types of you know, features that you have to model statically. There are notifications, notification builders, wearable extenders, intents, pending intents, pages, actions, all kinds of things that you kind of have to understand exactly how they work in this context. But with a static analysis built on top of this, we are actually able to figure out this type of structure. So we know exactly what is the GUI, so extension on the phone. And on top of that, we even managed to build a little testing tool that can use that to figure out how much coverage you have achieved during testing, to write test cases. You now my student created sort of a version of UI Automator that works on Android Wear. Uh, part of that involved in inserting instrumentation and so on. The details are not important right now, but we actually have kind of a starting point to do various interesting studies of how these two devices interact with each other. So I will stop with discussion of prior work here, and we'll move on to the last of my slides, which is about what you do next. Uh, this depends, of course, on your point of view. Uh, you know, some people prefer one set of problems, other people prefer other sets of problems. Um, as a static analysis guy, I like this problem, and I think we really need to work on it, which is how to strengthen our foundations for static analysis. It's just a very unsatisfactory state of affairs. It just is. Um, and the, the key problem, which sort of comes back to something that was asked earlier, is that we don't have a, a really well-defined specification of Android semantics. And the question is, how do you infer it? Google is not going to write a formal specification of Android. That's never going to happen. Can you infer this from a large number of dynamic traces? Can you validate in some sense that what you have inferred is sufficiently complete, whatever that means? How do you evolve it with the next generation of Android? All of these, I think, very fundamental questions. You know, it took people 10 years to get the formal semantics of Java right. You know, if you've heard of the Java memory model problem, that was, you know, that was a lot of fun for the PL community for a number of years. 
just to be able to describe what exactly it means to run a Java program, it, take a, it took a bunch of really smart people 10 years to kind of get it right. We have nothing like that for Android, I'm afraid. I mean, there have been some attempts to capture some aspects of it, but there's no comprehensive semantics, and that's a very, very shaky foundation. Going beyond that, um, how can you use a proper control flow analysis of the GUI to achieve interesting things? One thing that my, one of my students is currently looking at is how to do some performance improvements. You know, there are various mechanisms that essentially can make your app run better mm -hmm. in some sense by using, and, and typically people do this manually, so the question is how do you do automated you know, uh, transformations of the code. Not quite the same as compiler optimizations, but has a sort of similar flavor to it. Another way of thinking about this is sort of the flavor of automated refactoring. Um, and I think sort of the longer term questions are if you, if you consider the evolution of these devices, you know, phones were a big deal 10 years ago. They're not a big deal now. Everyone has one. Everyone has five phones by now, you know, <laughs> including the dead ones in, in your drawer. Um, you know, everyone's got a tablet probably sitting somewhere. What will happen going forward? Um, is it wearable devices that will be, become more popular and more interesting? Is Android Wear the platform that we should be looking at? I don't know. We have definitely continued looking at Android Wear types of problems, specifically for standalone apps without any attached phone. Um, is it IoT types of things? There's this Android Things thing which is you know, supposed to be sort of Google's plan to take over the IoT world now. Whether or not you believe in that is a separate question, but you know, this, this style of computing is absolutely coming, it already is here in some sense. Uh, and there are a lot of interesting problems from the software engineering programming languages point of view there. Um, so I would encourage especially our younger colleagues who are very creative and full of energy to look for new problems in those spaces because it's, it's going to be an interesting development over the next 10 to 20 years. So thank you for your attention, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Go ahead. In the context of automated rewriting, what optimizations are you finding are possible? Or so the typical thing, one thing that um, my, my students sort of claim is worth exploring is um, often when something happens on the phone, there's a very large number of apps that the, try to respond to it. If you know, of a, for example, broadcast receivers, there are a lot of broadcast receivers that sort of kick in at the same time, for example, when you receive a call or when some event happens. Um, that's not good because it basically freezes the phone. All of a sudden, you, 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 you have an event happening in front of you, you need to react to it. But the, the phone, in exactly the wrong moment, becomes very slow because many apps are trying to react to the same thing. So there are various, uh, Google is well aware of these problems. There are various, you know, for example, the so-called job service is one example of a feature that is intended to modify this behavior in such a way that you don't get sort of this freezing behavior. Um, that is the best answer I can give right now. Ask me again in three months, I'll give you a much better answer. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Go ahead. So the, I feel bad for you because the whole thing I was thinking while you were, while you were giving the first kind of two thirds of your talk was really Android GUIs are a DSL. They're a domain specific language, but they're not implemented that way. I mean, part of it is in the XML, but effectively they, they've kind of punted and said, well, instead of defining a DSL, we're going to implement a DSL by putting it in a generic general purpose programming language, i.e. Java, and then leaving it on the developer to kind of use design patterns to follow the, the to, to create this DSL. Absolutely. And what you're effectively trying to do is reverse engineer the specification of a, of a, of a thing Excellent as a point. DSL program from code that is not that. And of course the the, the Google people will say, well, this is great because you have so much flexibility. Because you know, with the DSL, you're constrained. Yeah. And if I, if you know, if the programmer really wants to do something that would be hard to do in a DSL, well, it's just Java. So you just put the code in there and you just do it. And and I wonder, you know, so so that's more of an observation than a question. But I wonder if the, you know, you see this a lot with frameworks, right? You know, if, if we were talking about Angular JS, for example, it'd be the same thing. There's there's you know, it's just JavaScript, but at the end of the day, they put all these weird patterns on it to create a set of conventions that forms a DSL, only there's no DSL. And so, Absolutely. as a static analysis person, you're kind of screwed. 
But well, no, no, I, I, I have to disagree with you. You have to do that. Right? This, this keeps me in business, so well, okay, I'm in good shape. <laughs> but, but I absolutely agree with you that we are sort of cleaning up someone else's mess. Yeah. Um, the argument, unfortunately, that would come against using DSLs, and by the way, I've heard this argument in other contexts as well, okay. that's a high-performance computing, is that people simply do not like to be constrained. Yeah. Even to their better interests, because no one likes to be told, oh, I know better than you. And this, is, this seems like a natural human reaction, where the PL people have managed to sort of get around that by basically forcing first year students to learn certain languages from day <laughs> one, and there's sort of no, no escape out of that. But even there, there are escape hatches. There's native calls in Java, and there's all kinds of funny things you can do if you really, really wanted to. I'm not even talking about C and C++, that's a long story. Um, I wish this <coughs> were the path that they would have taken. I would have worked on other problems, and the world would have been a better place. I completely agree. <laughs> um, unfortunately, I think that that's, that train has left the, left the train station. Yeah. Go ahead. So um, uh, as someone who uses a lot of static analysis in the area of Android, I can appreciate a stronger s static analysis foundations. But I'm wondering what is strong enough for you. So um, there's all sorts of uh, different <laughs> kinds of semantics you can model. Yeah, we can have an Android memory model and spend 10 years doing that. So from from your point of view, what, what's what's the, the good enoughness measure for uh, strong so enough that is also a very, very good question. Um, let me put it this way. When I keep seeing features that appear in many, many, many apps, and I don't see any static modeling of these popular features in existing work, that bothers me. That is, this means we're below the bar. Now, if you're talking about, I mean, the general memory model in some sense is not a good example because it talks about some extremely esoteric circumstances of concurrent access to certain types of shared memory and all that, which pragmatically probably don't matter that much. I mean, it matters for the hardcore PL folks, and that's great, you need people to work on these problems. As far as practical you know, implications, it's probably not that important. I think we're very far away from that point. I mean, it is definitely a diminishing returns type of game, uh, but I think the returns are still pretty big. You know, we have a long way to go until we're at a point where we can say, eh, it's good enough. So where exactly that point is, I don't know. I, I will know probably intuitively when I get there. When hopefully someone else get there. You know, I'm hoping for the, young, you know, for the young generation to sort of do a better job than what we have done. Other questions? Is it's a, a follow-up question, actually, I think. So does this mean that we're looking at the wrong abstraction when we do a static analysis? Mm -hmm. Right, because you're looking at kind of the very low Java level, right? And uh, there's a lot of libraries that keep evolving. And you're saying that for every generation of libraries, we have to come up with different kind of modelings, mm -hmm. right? Events and whatever, so whatever, right? Um, but if you look at Java, it's not the case, right? The language has, has been stable for a long time, but the library keeps changing, right? But we're not analyzing the libraries. We don't have to model the libraries manually. That's, that's one thing, right? So maybe, would it be a good idea to raise the level of abstraction of looking at something different or, you know? Yes, the answer is always yes. The question <laughs> is how. Yeah. So, you know, if, if there were DSL involved, for example, yeah. which goes back to your earlier question, that's, that's the prime example of uh, someone chose the right abstractions for the problem. That's right. why it's a domain-specific language. Yeah, yeah. And they chose the semantics of it to kind of match what you really need to worry about. And everything kind of falls naturally into place if your language is. I mean, I've seen this in HPC. I work with HPC folks that deal with you know, high, uh, DSLs for certain categories of computations. It's so much easier to think about the problem at the level of mathematical objects as opposed to low level C pointers. It's just, it's a world of difference. I don't know what the answer is to Android. I'm ashamed to say that, but I don't. So I have a kind of related question to that. It seems like it's been a maintenance nightmare here, right? Because every time Android changes, potentially you guys have to go back and re Absolutely, yeah. update yeah. your analyses. So, so I think this is a this is a, high, a sort of a, a higher level question about how do you how do you handle framework based applications in the presence of framework evolution? Right. Um, 
I would say that the core problem, which is what I'm alluding to here in the first bullet, is that you need to find intelligent ways to automatically infer relatively complete specification. That's, yes, we have a lot of work on sort of inference of, you know, API analysis and mining this and dynamic traces and all that, which is good. It's, it's, it's a good starting point, but I think there's a lot more to be done. Some of it will involve human, human you know, sort of intelligence to say, here are the five key abstractions you need to worry about, and this is how they map to certain programmatic entities, be it you know, every instance of class activities, you know, something like that. So you will have some inevitable manual uh, work, but it's much easier if everything else is automated, because I can read the documentation, and even if Google hasn't done a good job of explaining the low-level semantics, at least they provide enough information to figure out what are the key abstractions. So I can write those manually you know, myself. The rest I want probably through dynamic analysis, get a million, billion, trillion traces, and try to find the best possible semantic description that explains all of them, and hope that they're sufficiently comprehensive. In an automated way? Abs oh, absolutely, of course. <laughs> <laughs> so this is where dynamic analysis, I mean, and also, you know, I mean, this, this comes down to issues of like data mining types of problems, maybe even machine learning types of techniques, I don't know. But it's, I think it's a wide open problem. And it should be solved. So there is a um, there's going to be a reception downstairs uh, right after this. Um, so let's thank the speaker. Thank you. Thank you.